Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our very long series about the living world. Probably going to be 20 plus videos. Should have broken it up into different sub series, but whatever. Here we are. So, topic for the day is going to be the endocrine system. As always, let me get you your objectives and then we'll jump into it. So, by the end of this video, be able to do or know the following things. First up, understand the function of a hormone. Second, Explain the difference between water and lipid solid soluble hormones. And finally, describe the function of a local regulator. So before we start talking about all that, let's start with a discussion of the endocrine system. Just basically, what is it? Essentially, the endocrine system is a system of long distance signaling in the body, and it uses targeted chemicals called hormones. These targeted chemicals travel in the bloodstream. So a lot of the regulation that happens on our body, um, growth, development, sexual uh, reproduction, um, well, those are three that I've got off the top of my head. They're all regulated by hormones, and essentially what happens with a hormone is there are endocrine organs, which, we'll which we will talk about in a second, that secrete hormones into the bloodstream. Those bloodstream traveling hormones will head off to specific cells where there are receptors to receive them, and then a response will be initiated in those cells. Now, recognize that endocrine system is based on the specificity of the hormone to the receptor on a cell. So certain hormones contact all cells, but they only cause a response in some cells, the cells that have the receptors able to actually rea react with them. You may have one hormone that works on many different types of cells, but each of those cells will have a receptor specific for that hormone. Before we talk specifically about hormones, um, I just want to quickly brush over different types of intercellular communication. This is communication from one cell to the other. So just down the line, endocrine, we're going to talk about through this video, but that is using hormones traveling long distances through the bloodstream. You have paracrine si signaling, and paracrine also goes with autocrine signaling, and this is where a cell releases chemicals that diffuse to the cells that are right around it, so the um, molecules that are being sent out aren't necessarily traveling through the bloodstream, they're just affecting the cells in their immediate vicinity. You've got nervous signaling, which will get its own series down the road a little bit, but that is using neurons and synapses and neurotransmitters and all that good stuff. And you've got pheromones, which are signals that are actually sent out into the air, and they travel through the air from one organism to the next. A uh, perfect example of pheromone usage are moths. Moths are able to secrete pheromones into the air, and they can travel for miles, uh, attracting mates to come and mate with a female moth. So that would be an example of a pheromone chemical signaling through the air. Now let's go ahead and talk specifically about the endocrine system itself. Um, first thing you really need to know is that the endocrine system is made up of a ton of different tissues and organs. So within some organs of the body, let's say the stomach, the stomach has got some cells within it that have an endocrine function, meaning that they secrete some hormones. In other cases, there are whole organs that are um, dedicated to endocrine function. A good example of an endocrine organ would be the uh, hypothalamus or the pituitary gland, both of those organs that are or organs that are dedicated to the secretion of hormones. Uh, you also get the adrenal glands that sit up on top of the kidneys and the testes and the ovaries. All of these are organs that are just dedicated to secreting hormones, so they are known as endocrine tissues and organs. Um, all of our hormones can be broken down into three different classes, and I'm going to go through a little bit about each one of them. So first class of hormones is going to be a peptide hormone. It is a string of amino acids formed together into a peptide. These are going to be like proteins. Things to know about a peptide hormone. First thing is they are not lipid soluble. So they dissolve in water, but they don't dissolve in lipids. Because they don't dissolve in lipids, they are not able to cross the cell membrane. So because they can't cross the cell membrane, they rely on cell membrane receptors in order to get anything done. We'll talk about how they get done, get stuff done in a second, but Peptide hormones rely on cell signal receptors because they cannot diffuse through the membrane. Then you've got an amine hormone. 
These guys are made out of specific amino acids. They are usually not solid in lipids. Occasionally they are, but usually they're not. So because they usually are not, they also rely on a cell surface receptor. And then you've got steroid hormones. Steroid hormones are made out of steroids, which are generally four rings derived from cholesterol. These guys are able to diffuse through the cell membrane. So once they've diffused through the cell membrane, they rely on a receptor within the cell in order to start their, I guess, transduction pathway. So we'll talk about each of these in a second. I just wanted to get you a quick overview before we actually got to them specifically. So a little more specifically, talking about water-soluble hormones, these guys are going to be ones that are able to dissolve in water, but they don't dissolve in lipids. Amines, or, um, amines and peptide hormones are a good example of this. The way they get their stuff done is through signal transduction pathways, which we have talked about quite a lot. So our hormone is traveling around in body fluids. It finds its target cell and it binds to a specific receptor. That specific receptor sets off a signal transduction pathway, which if you remember, it's a series of molecules that relay a message from one to the next. And eventually they will get to their target molecule, which is gonna lead to some sort of response in the cell. Now, in contrast to this, you have got a lipid-soluble hormone, those steroid hormones. In a lipid-soluble hormone, they'll travel through the bloodstream. When they get to the cell that they are looking for, they usually will just diffuse straight across the membrane of the cell to the inside, where they will seek out generally the nucleus. Within the nucleus, they will alter transcription so that either something doesn't get made or something does get made, the transcription of a gene either increases or decreases. Either way, they are diffusing across the membrane and generally acting on uh, transcription of something within the nucleus. Now there are some hormones that have multiple effects. Actually, I would say most hormones have multiple effects. Now this hormone right here is epinephrine. Epinephrine is also commonly known as adrenaline. Sorry, spelling is hard. Um, so adrenaline we know is a stress hormone that comes about when you are in a situation that requires a fight or flight response. Now that response requires many parts of your organs to be doing different things. So Adrenaline, for example, adrenaline is released by the adrenal glands, gets into the bloodstream, starts circulating, and does a couple things. First thing is it hits the liver. In the liver, it causes glycogen, which is a starch, to be broken down, releasing glucose into the bloodstream so that you've got a quick burst of energy and sugar to deal with a stressful situation. Um, it also causes constriction and dilation of various blood vessels. So blood vessels that are routed to skeletal muscles are going to open up so more blood and more oxygen get to those muscles. And at the same time, smooth muscles around the digestive tract are going to constrict those blood vessels so that blood isn't being wasted on digestion. It can be routed out to the places where it is more readily needed. So in the case of adrenaline, this hormone goes out and there are several types of cells that have receptors for it, and each one of those cells, when adrenaline binds to it, is going to show a different type of response. But all those responses are coordinated together into the fight-or-flight response that we know can be attributed to adrenaline. And this is our final slide for the day. There are signal molecules called local regulators. They're not hormones, but they work in much the same way, so we kind of wanted to just mention them real quick. Essentially what a local regulator is, is it's a signal molecule that is released by a cell and it acts on the cells that are around it. Now, the cells respond in much the same way they would respond to a hormone in that the local regulator is a specifically shaped molecule that only binds to a certain type of receptor and then it sets off a signal transduction response just like an endocrine signaler or hormone would. Um, local regulators are generally broken into two different categories. You've got paracrine and autocrine. In a paracrine regulator, generally the signal molecule is acting on the cells that are in the immediate vicinity, so the neighbors around the cell. An autocrine uh, regulator is a molecule that actually acts on the cell itself. If you look at the very bottom diagram down there, that's an example of an autocrine signal where the cell is releasing signal molecules that are actually binding to its own receptors. Um, off the top of my head, I can't think of a reason that autocrine signaling would be used, but the body uses it, so I'm sure that there is a good reason for it. So 
That's it. Quick overview of endocrine signaling in the body. Hopefully that was helpful for you. Thank you for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and we'll see you again.